We will now begin with the professor's speeches and ask them to give their hypothetical final talks. We will begin with Rebecca Henderson from Harvard Business School. Let's give her a big round of applause. Oyaku, thank you very much for that friendly introduction. Um, thank you all for coming on this confusingly beautiful day in February. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, although it is very daunting. The idea that I can say everything I want to say in seven minutes, no problem, is uh, a little overwhelming. But here goes. You ready? I, um, I teach here at the business school where I teach a course called Reimagining Capitalism. And my last lesson for you is yes, we can do it. Yes, we must do it. Yes, it can be done. So that's 28 one and a half hour sessions in seven minutes. <laughs> Capitalism has been the greatest source of prosperity the world has ever seen. And it has been a fundamental driver of political and economic freedom. The population of the world has tripled since my grandfather was born, but GDP per head has quintupled, and we are both freer and richer than we have ever been. But I also believe that capitalism is on the verge of destroying both the planet and the fabric of our society, and that this process is unfolding with unnerving speed. We do not have the luxury of sitting back and hoping that things will fix themselves. Unfortunately, neither the right nor the left offers us plausible solutions. The right hopes that we will grow our way out of our problems, but uncontrolled growth in itself seems likely only to make our environmental problems worse, and steadily increasing returns to scale, coupled with accelerated automation and the increasing concentration of political power, suggest that business as usual is likely to give us more inequality, not less. The left looks to government to solve these problems, but our problems are global, and our politics are increasingly deadlocked, fragmented, and angry. What then should we do? In this context, I propose that we need to rethink and reimagine capitalism, and that this requires rethinking three deep assumptions. The first is that there is no way to both make money and to address challenges like poverty or climate change. But as the path-breaking work of my colleague Michael Porter and his colleagues and many others have shown, we have more and more evidence at billion-dollar scale that this is simply not true. Moreover, action by individual firms is increasingly having system-wide effects. Investment by only even a single firm legitimates new ways of doing things, drives technologies down the experience curve, and shifts consumer demand. And when action by individual firms isn't proving to be enough, firms are increasingly recognizing this, forming associations and partnerships within regions and within industries to improve educational systems, control corruption, and stop deforestation by making and enforcing agreements that make doing the right thing pre-competitive. There is no economic or technological reason that we cannot build a competitive capitalism and take care of the natural world and our societies at the same time. Secondly, we assume that the private sector is naturally hostile to any suggestion that we increase the power of government. And there's lots of evidence that without smart and effective government, we cannot solve the problems that we face. But decades of research has established that inclusive institutions, things like democracy, a free press, high levels of transparency, well-run bureaucracies, and the rule of law, are much more reliable level, uh, drivers of reliable economic growth than the alternatives. Good government is good for business. We need to reclaim that assumption in spades. Last, but by no means least, Many people believe that, that the private sector, I'm sorry, last but by no means least, many people believe that it is wrong or inappropriate for managers to act on personal values, to even talk about values in the workplace. 
that it is not okay in the boardroom to say that the planet is burning and we cannot pursue business as usual. That to do so brands oneself as soft, as idealistic, or as not understanding the hard realities of the business world. Many business people, particularly in the US, believe that the business of business is business, and that the social responsibility of business is to maximize its profits. But the deepest moral commitments of capitalism are to free and fair markets, and to the innovation, efficiency, and freedom that they generate. When the integrity of these markets is threatened by unpriced externalities, rampant inequality of opportunity, and the rot of crony capitalism, a manager's deepest commitment should be to the integrity of the system itself, as well as to the profitability of his or her enterprise. Stepping up to address the problems we face is thus not just economically sensible. I believe that if you are a card-carrying capitalist, it is also normatively required by the very values that make capitalism legitimate. It is wrong to say business cannot act on these problems because they should only maximize profit. That is fundamentally incorrect. My guess is that you know where I'm going with this. You're thinking I'm going to tell you that we're not going to see these changes unless you actively try to make it happen, and I am. There is nothing guaranteed about the pathway that I have very briefly laid out. The 12th century philosopher Mamiades is rumored to have said, hope is the belief in the plausibility of the possible as opposed to the necessity of the probable. Probably where we're going is not much fun. Probably, if we continue business as usual, business will not rethink these assumptions and our problems will only get worse. But things could change, and they will change. If you and us and everyone who cares about these issues commits to acting. This isn't a technological or an economic problem. It's a political and social one, and we've solved these problems before. Tribes fought tribes, and then cities fought cities, and then nations fought nations, and we have entered the atomic bomb. But the last 50 years has been the most peaceful on the planet for thousands of years. When my great-grandfather was born, married women couldn't own property. When my grandfather was born, women couldn't vote. And when I was born, there were no tenured women on the faculty at HBS. But things change. The idea that women, or the Irish, or the Italians, or people with differently colored skin are people, really people, is historically revolutionary. But we've more or less managed to embrace it. We can change if we want to. Let me close by telling you what keeps me going, because this work can be hard and difficult at times, and we are all prone to despair. But I'm a Buddhist, and so I believe that there is good news and bad news. The good news is that we're not going to die. The bad news is it's because we don't really exist. The illusion that we exist is very persuasive, but as the physicists tell us, it is only an illusion. We are bundles of atoms, patterns of energy, songs the universe is singing. In the end, all that matters is being true to that song. We may, we may change the world, we may fail, but all that matters is the joy of trying. Thank you very much. <laughs>